let's uh, let's start with a little prayer. As we gather this morning, let's be grateful for the ability to come together through this weather and to spend some time honoring the possibility that exists from moment to moment in our daily lives to participate in compassion, kindness, understanding, and justice in the world that we live in that needs these. So as I was um, preparing the talk, I came across um, um, a quote that was that's in one of the books that we're using um, for our Centering Prayer class. And um, in this book, there's a quote about how God's will is revealed to us moment by moment in our lives. And so this idea of talking about revelation and evolution together is what kind of generated thought. <clears throat> so what if heaven is not some far off, infinitely expansive utopia that's way out of our reach life? What if it's a string of moments that's right in our midst and waiting for us to connect to each one? Um, I've been participating in a writing workshop. I've realized I forgot a couple of items over here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we, we were, one of our little warm-up exercises was to write something about how we pray with our body. I just wanted to start with this. When my lungs pray, they move in rhythm with God's breath. They dance in unison with molecules that never cease. They harmonize with all living things that come before and that follow. They give. They receive, not knowing the trails of good or evil, human or divine. They merely rise and fall, giving and receiving, participating and sustaining. If you've heard me talk before in here, you've likely heard me refer to the cloud of unknowing because I refer to it a lot. Um, one of the lines in there that's paraphrased in a um, one of the translations from it is, I give up all the things I can think to love the thing I cannot think. This idea that we that our thinking brain in some ways is separating us for, from, from God. Um, and that is one of the reasons why um, I try so hard to practice and keep practice and teach Conspire with Matt so that I don't forget to practice. <laughs> um, because when we, when we practice letting go of our thoughts and our constructs and even our image of God, we allow ourselves to be open to that string of moment by moment heaven that's possible in, in our daily lives. <clears throat> Richard Rohr says, we over-identify with image, with what we think we are, what we would like to be, or with our reputation, with whom others tell us we should be. Both of them are the world of perception. We need to get back to substance and essence. God is there. That's from Everything Belongs. So sometimes when I put these talks together, I look at the lectionary for the week, which is making me smile a little bit, because if you know my history, you know that I've been quite frightened of scripture in my past. Um, um, but thankfully, Father Kierkop, who's a, a Jesuit priest, has invited me to read, read scripture and um, allow it to read you rather than have someone's interpretation of it um, cause you fear or harm, which is my, my history with it. So I looked up um, some of the lectionary for today, and Job 42 um, was what came up on the list. Job answered God, I'm convinced you can do anything and everything. 
Nothing and no one can upset your plans. You asked, who is muddying the water, ignorantly confusing the issue, second-guessing my purposes? I admit it, I was the one. I babbled on about things far beyond me, made small talk about wonders way over my head. You told me, listen, and let me, let me do the talking. Let me ask the questions. You give the answers. I admit I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. I'm sorry, forgive me. I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of hearsay, crumbs of rumor. Later in the passage, God blessed Job's um, later life even more than in his earlier life. And rather get, than get hung up on the all the gifts and wonders and things that came into his life after that, I wanted to focus on Focus on the concept of who's muddying the water, who's keeping us from seeing God as God really is in our daily lives. So how does our participation on the surface of the water and in the storms that rage around us and, the, and create the turbulence just below the water? How does the muddy water and raging storms keep us from seeing and participating in heaven that's hidden in the moments of our daily lives. So when we practice, um, when we do spiritual practices that help us empty our minds or become aware of the thoughts that we have, um, we are able to begin to detach a little bit from the, the falseness that's all around us. The last talk that I did, I don't know how many of you all were in here, but I had a, I had a light fixture that I used that kind of showed what happens at the ego surface of our lives, what we become so entangled with, the messaging about competition, about the image that we portray to others. When we get really tangled in that, um, it's, it's like this analogy of the muddy water. You imagine this, this river that's got so much mud in it. It's just a brown <laughs> flowing mass. But at, if we think about these particles as our thoughts, if we began to let them settle, how different is that river um, when we let those things fall and let go of them? Suddenly, we can imagine that there are actually rays of light that can make it to the riverbed. And where it's calm and still and a firm foundation with all this turbulence happening above it. <clears throat> when all things return to the one, as in Job's story, where we let go of all of our attachments and all these things that we think define us, when all these things return to the one, even gold loses its value. But when one returns to all things, even the pebbles sparkle. That's from John Wu and the Golden Age of Zen. So we need to empty ourselves, our limitations, our judgments, human constructs, and the lenses with which we attempt to see an image of God. Every way we think about or talk about God is a human construct. We're limited by our imagination and projections. We cannot fully know God or create an image that would be precise. <clears throat> we, can't, we can't perceive God's will in that same light, not in hindsight even, and not in anticipation or prediction. Is a quote from C.S. Lewis. I, Lord, I could never have guessed how beautiful you are. We'll not say that, rather we'll say, so it was you all along. Everyone I ever loved, it was you. Everything decent or fine that ever happened to me. Everything that made me reach out and try to be better. It was you all along. And he's speaking of when we meet God. 
So if we can't predict or understand God's will, we can say that we are here to serve, forgive, and be compassion, compassionate to one another. How practically we are to do these is only revealed to us moment by moment as the circumstances of our lives evolve. So, if we are so consumed with our own lives, our projections, our expectations, our um, idea about what we have to do or be to make ourselves happy, if we get so consumed by these things, we're spending a lot of our time in the future and a lot of our time in the past, and we're not engaging with that string of moments. We're not engaged, we don't recognize the gift that lays right in front of our face with that, like um, Tolstoy's The Three Questions, who's the most important person, what's the most important time, and what am I to do? Those, those answers only lie in the present moment. So what I'm proposing is that practice, whatever types of practice, meditation, different Ignatian practices, Benedictine practices, these all help us get into the present moment where honestly this deep connection and, um, and God's present with others is possible. Paula Darcy says the way you approach something or someone deeply affects everything that follows that. And that's what I'm saying is how we participate in God's will is we come to the present moment with vision that's not cluttered or muddied by these concerns or even our perception of what God's will might be for us. Even that can muddy our waters. We need to be in the present moment and see things differently so that we can react and respond with love. <clears throat> so I'll say it again. Practicing love, forgiveness, compassion, and non-judgment brings us closer to the moment, detaching ourselves from our pain, projections, expectations, and distractions. Practice brings us closer to heaven, revealed to us one moment at a time. It's not about not doing something. This is something that I was misunderstood when I first started meditating and Thinking about Buddhist non-attachment, I was thinking, well, if I just sat around and did nothing, nothing would ever happen. Um, but it's, it's about helping us see opportunity for reconciliation, connection, and compassionate action in the moments as they reveal themselves. It helps us take action that's grounded in love, not blinded by our own attachments and expectations. <clears throat> Ronald Rollheiser, in his book, The Holy Longing, which is one of my favorite books I've ever read, says that the God of the Incarnation has real flesh on earth and speaks to us in the bread and butter of our lives through things that have skin. If I pray for world peace, but do not, inside of myself, forgive those who have hurt me, how can God bring about peace on this planet? Our prayer needs to have flesh to back it up. Incarnation is putting flesh to the prayer. To the extent our soul is alive, we are satisfied with the enoughness of the present moment or in, in touch with reality. We find ways to put prayers into action from this perspective. What if evolution is revelation in motion? We're called to participate. Incarnation puts the prayer into practice. Um, this is an image of the closing prayer that we do in our Centering Prayer class here. And um, it's begun to really be a symbol for me of how, how we are to live our lives. Um, and I'm not sure where Judy Leatherwood Smith got this, but she brought this practice to us. And we stand in a circle and we lift our left hand up 
and we extend our right hand down. And what it symbolizes is that we receive from the one source that gives us compassionate energy, God, sacred mystery, however you, um, however you label God. And we extend our right hand out to the world. And the work that we do is keeping this conduit as clear as possible. The practice that we do um, gives us an active presence in the world, but it's grounded in openness in receiving grace and extending prayer, active prayer into the world. If, if I could look back on the times in my life when I've been depressed and very concerned about maintaining my own energy or thinking I'm not worthy of God's love, I've spent it like this. And even in those times, I worked really hard to give love and to be compassionate in the world. And it was exhausting. And you can imagine why, because it all had to come from me alone. So if I extend this hand up and receive that from, from the source and, um, and have an open conduit to receive that, I've got a lot more to give. If I become concerned about other things in my life, I may retract this hand and I may, I may feel very full of love and grace and full of myself, if you will, if I can't extend the other hand and, and keep that channel open and find ways to make that practice part of my life. So how does the practice facilitate this? Mindfulness helps us be aware of the moment. Um, one, of the, one of the things I love about mindfulness is that it, it can quickly, once we practice it enough, it can quickly be a reminder about um, what we need in the moment. If I, I suffer from um, depression and anxiety, um, and if you know anything about the Enneagram, I'm a type six on the Enneagram. So fear motivates me and, um, and fear can really get a hold of me. Um, but if I am, am practicing mindfulness, I can sense my body's triggers that are telling me, you know, your thought engine has left the station <laughs> without you. And I can be so far in the future with what ifs that I can't even function in the present moment. But mindfulness practice allows me to be mindful of my body's trigger saying, uh-oh, something is, something is scaring me or I'm worried about something. I'm gonna check in to the present moment and set, report to myself like a camera. I am, I am standing here um, and I can just look at what truly exists. I don't know if you all were um, were here when the Zen master Mao San came. Um, Bill's had him here a couple of times, um, but he when he talks about getting out of our thoughts and into what is right in front of our face and listing it in reality, it can really give us that grounding that we need to say, you know. My thoughts may be exciting, but they're not necessarily real. <laughs> and they may never be this fear that I have, this what if situation may never play out. Um, when it, one of our children um, had a real bout with anxiety and, and had a hard time going, getting out of the car and going into the school, we practiced a little mindfulness. And this is how simple it could be. I asked him, tell me what you see. Look around and tell me what you see right now. It doesn't matter how silly it sounds. Just tell me, tell me what you can observe. And he would say, there's a car parked in front of us. There's, you know, this house has a driveway on the left-hand side and just descriptively telling me what's all around him. Suddenly, his, his body reaction to anxiety was low enough to where he could think clearly about whether or not there was a present danger um, in walking into the school and that helped him relieve that engine that we get in internally with our with our adrenaline and everything else that keeps us from thinking clearly.
so so mindfulness and um, just having an awareness of how our thoughts can really get away from us um, can help us in our daily lives as spiritual beings. Meditation helps us calm the mind as well, and it helps us realize the thought patterns that we have. If there's a recurring thought that pops up in meditation, I'm suddenly beginning to understand what I need to work on and what's, you know, maybe what's separating me from the life I want. Um, I'm not asking myself to figure it out in meditation, but during meditation, I certainly get clues on things that I, I might need to um, make some changes with and make some different choices in my life. <clears throat> the Ignatian practice of the examine of consciousness um, helps us identify the unique ways that we turn away and turn toward God in the fabric of our daily lives. The instructions are um, the, the Jesuits that um, the monastics in this tradition were required to do this prayer twice a day. So you do it at the noon, noon hour and you do it before you go to bed at night. And I've talked about this one in here before um, as well, so forgive the, the repetition. Um, but it, they're simple instructions, and they quickly, quickly help us realize what our patterns are. And rather than, than this being a moral judgment about repenting for your sins, it's truly the repenting and change of, change of mind, changing the way you think about this, rather than giving yourself more shame and guilt. What you do is you, at noon, you rewind your day and you look back at, at the interactions that you've had and the things that happened from that time all the way back to when you got out of bed or when you woke up that morning. And you, you look for things in that little rewind that help you see that you might have disconnect, had a disconnected response to to your partner or your children or yourself for that matter. Maybe um, maybe you beat yourself up about something you did the day before or something, but it helps us recognize where, where fear was working or, um, or where we had the opportunity to be a better listener or to connect better with another or to forgive ourselves of something um, that we wish we had done better. And then you let a prayer kind of come out of that rewind. Many times for me, my noontime practice is about how I responded to the kids, getting them or getting um, our, our son to school that morning. Um, I'll think about something he opened up a conversation and I'll realize, had I not been preoccupied with the what if of how this was going to <laughs> form his later life, but stayed in the moment and been a more compassionate listener, that would have been turning towards God. That would have been um, participating with more compassion and understanding. Um, and what this does is it allows us to make it to not not beat ourselves up about that choice, but to to bring that as a prayer into the rest of our day. Or if you're doing it at night, bring that intention into the next day. And I found this is one of those things that's simple to do, but hard to keep yourself in this practice to do it. I mean, it literally can take five to 10 minutes twice a day. That's about as quick a practice I know of that you could incorporate into your life, but it, it, does, take, um, it does take a commitment to, to do it. It also has a very quick change, positive change in your life that it can make. I've, um, I, could, I could possibly track the patterns of how much different my morning commute is with our son when I'm practicing this than when I'm not. Ronald Rollheiser, um, also in the book The Holy Longing, says most of us who are Christian have at least this in common about Jesus. We admire him. As Kierkegaard once pointed out, however, this is not enough. What Jesus wants from us is not admiration, but imitation. Humble, honest, wholehearted participation <clears throat> is our responsibility, particularly in a time 
and place that needs healing at every level of our existence, in ourselves, our family lives, our local and global communities. from John O'Donohue, a blessing is a circle of light drawn around a person to protect, heal, and strengthen. A blessing awakens future wholeness. It forebrightens the way. The heart dreams of a state of wholeness, a place where everything comes together, where loss will be made good, where blindness will transform into vision, where damage will be made whole. To invoke a blessing <clears throat> is to call some of that wholeness upon a person now. So I'm asking that we practice mindfulness, we practice awareness, and we participate in life-giving heaven on earth. That revelation, evolution, and an incarnational revolution is possible. So how will you participate in this string of moments of now, now, now? Mm -hmm.